this is for you to ask us questions and for us to try to answer them. So. Oh, sorry, Megan. Me. I don't know. I, I obviously we did some uh, significant changes with regard to job training and workforce development this year. I think that that's going to be great for the state of Idaho, and look, I look forward to seeing how that gets structured. Um, I think that the sideboards put on the Idaho Lunch Program will make it even more successful than it was in the initial bill, and so I, I think that that's an important workforce training program that that we put forward. Additionally, we put money into high school CTE to try to make sure that all these Idaho kids are as successful as possible. So the combination of the two programs, I think, are, are really going to do well for Idaho. And, and I think that is a, a major accomplishment for the legislature this year. All right. Uh, one of the things that was important to the majority caucus this year was voter integrity. Even though many of us acknowledge that our system is very good in Idaho, our courts and secretary of state, I think, would acknowledge that most of our uh, legislators would as well, but there were some items that we were interested in addressing as a majority caucus. One of them was the uh, hand count requirement if we go to a, a post audit on an election. We also tightened up um, our voter uh, ID requirements, a couple bills to deal with that. We forbid a, a, a ranked choice election. That was House Bill 179, and then House Bill 11 did, sorry, forgot <laughs> it right there, uh, prohibits any state employee from accepting private dollars to conduct an election. So we're very happy with the uh, minor changes that we made, but there are big changes going forward. I just want to clarify, or, or actually highlight um, a few of the things we did in Ken education this year. Obviously, we, we invested significantly in the public education and increased teacher salaries, uh, classified staff. We increased the, the pay for classified staff. We also did some significant things for parental rights and education. Uh, one of those is we clarified some uniformity around the state and in our school districts on how parents can communicate with their administrators and teachers. We also uh, passed uh, uh, proud rights and open enrollment. So now, and the districts around the state, they will have to have an open enrollment policy. So, so parents have a choice in where they send their kids to school. Uh, so we're, we're, we're uh, pleased with those accomplishments this year in education and, and in addition to just the significant investments that we made in education this year overall. With that, I think we'll start with some questions for the speaker or for any of us that you have. Sure. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what's, I guess, were some of the things that you wanted to get done this year that didn't necessarily make it across the finish line? Oh, I think if you look at like ESA, we need to find a solution to that. And I think that... Um, I was hoping we could resolve a library issue. Those two issues have been around for the last couple of years. They're not going to go away. I was hoping we could resolve this year. We're closer. There's more debate that's out there to happen, but the ideas are coming forward now. You saw some new bills toward the end of the session in regards to the tax credits and other ideas to try to address that. But those are the two, I think, that stand out the most. The property tax one, though, I kind of want to go back on that a little bit. That was historic, and I think people don't realize that that's a that's an ongoing, increasing revenue amount that's going to go to property tax relief. So I really want to emphasize the importance of what we do on property taxes. And I really want to emphasize what I've said in the past. Let, the legislature doesn't collect property taxes and we don't spend them. Those are all done locally. And that's kind of why I mentioned what I did about the historic funding for roads and everything else. These local governments have an opportunity to help address that property tax issue too. We've given them the resource to do it and I hope that they, they utilize that. But I kind of want to focus on the property tax the most because I think it's the most important thing we had called this issue. Joe? Yeah, on property tax, so we had a lot of headlines, you know, this passes, whatever, the governor signs it. Um, the, the biggest question we got, though, is as an average Idahoan, what does this mean to me if I don't know about tax policy? How would you answer that? Well, it means that it, you're going to get between a 10 and 25% reduction depending on where you live in your property tax bill. It means that the local governments have the opportunity to add to that so it could be even greater than that. And it means that going forward, since it's tied to the sales tax, it's going to grow. So that, that relief is not one time, it's, it, it grows over time. So, so it's, it's a good, good start at uh, addressing that issue. But I still, Joe, like I said, you still gotta remember though, the state doesn't collect them and doesn't spend them. And so we've now taken an ongoing sales tax revenue to subsidize those local taxing districts. And hopefully they will do the right thing and, and uh, pass the savings on, but also try to help on their end of the thing. Well, and if I can reinforce Representative from Speaker Boyle's uh, point, is that the budgeting is done locally. The, the state clearly has no involvement on what the local budgets are. And so we're doing everything we can to try to alleviate some of the pressure. But the fact is, 
the locals are where the focus needs to be. That that's who is raising those taxes, that's who's collecting them, that's who's spending them. And they're spending it based upon the budgets they set. So just to reinforce this, the speaker's comments, we're doing what we can, but the locals need to take some responsibility for their own budgeting. There's another part of that bill too, the only month of bill. The fact that we're now gonna put money into bonds and supplemental, and if they don't have any bonds and supplemental, that pot of gold can go to build future buildings. We've set up the framework in the future to allow it, so we will need property tax uh, taxes to buy to pay for buildings. And you'll see more steps to add on to that in the next year, tied into your earlier question. Now, yeah. uh, so we just finished the session. Yeah. Uh, we already know of a few lawsuits that have been filed or are coming based on policy decisions that you all made. How do you justify the cost of defending these laws to taxpayers? I think that every one of those issues there were being threatened with lawsuits when Fort and Idaho owns, or they wouldn't have passed with the majorities they did. And I think that sometimes you have to go through that process to let the courts weigh in. We know where the citizens are. We passed the legislation to address the concerns of the majority of the citizens. Now you have to let the courts weigh in. Uh, going back to the courts, touching on the changes made to the Judicial Council, can you tell us a little bit what those changes do and how it addresses the concern you talked about at the beginning of the year? Yeah, if you go back to the beginning of state history of the state of Idaho, one of the when they did our constitution, one of the things they were worried about was that the judges would be elected. There's a lot of court history on that. 1967, we went to judicial council to replace vacancies when a judge retires or is just just gone. And when they did that, they gave the control mostly to the courts, Supreme Court justice and others. That board that is on sister has now been broadened. The governor now has the opportunity to have more than just one slate of two to four. He can say, I don't like this slate. They can set more and gives him more options. It also gives the ability for the candidates to know what the others are saying about them. Part of that process allows other attorneys to say what they like and don't like. They can say, hey, you know, Logan, we like this about you, but not that. And in the past, they had no idea what it was. Now they get to have that information. So it made it more, more you know, visible. It increased the number of participants who decide who's going to be there. And it gives the governor more options. Yeah. Uh, ready to jump on the six. A lot of conversation both in the state and nationally about HB uh, 242. Um, why was that important that that got signed yesterday? And what is that going to be? Okay, so no, give me numbers. Give me. Oh, some. sorry. Yeah. Four, 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 sorry. Say that again. Four, 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 right. Bars. I think it's important because it keeps the parents involved. One of the things that was on national news this morning, I think, on NBC, and they kind of missed the the, the, the whole thing behind the bill. The parents need to know when their child has an issue with that. But they, you don't need people kidnapping children or taking them outside the state. So I think that uh, it was a way to protect not only the children, but the parents and the knowledge the parents have of what's going on in their child's life. So, Mr. Speaker, would you, yeah, would, you, would you say the concerns about that bill have been mischaracterized or overblown? Have you seen Governor Inslee next door in Washington express concerns? Yeah, I, I, I think they have been. And I think that if you really read it, what the bill does, you know, parent notification is not a bad thing. There's nothing that prevents a parent who decides to do that to take their child across state lines. It's not what it's about. It was about the next door neighbor taking the child without the parents knowing. And so I think that, you know, I think that some of the concerns about that were blown and, and, and put yourself in that position if you're a child. Would you want to know what's going on? Absolutely. So I think it's almost a protection for the children and, and not, I think it's been blown a cold ball. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, you talked about ESAs and school choice, those kind of issues have been kicking around the House and the Senate for several years. What do you think has been the big obstacle to getting something, getting a resolution? Well, I think the obstacle is similar to the property tax issue. I think you need to get all the issues out there and get everybody to see what the ideas are and, and have that discussion. One of the problems I felt this year with the ESA issue, for example, was we never had a chance to have all those bills introduced so everybody could see the different ideas. I think that's why you saw it again, for example, when the, the Revenue Tax Committee kicked out the idea of tax credits. I think to resolve this, you need to get all the ideas introduced through bills and then have the mix and match like you saw with the property tax bill where everybody can have their say. And I, you haven't had that yet. You saw a lot of folks keep their ideas close to themselves and not share them. And when you do that, it limits people's ability to understand them and also limits your ability to find a solution. But I think next year you'll see more of those ideas out because you saw some introduced issue, which will help push the issue forward. 
It didn't go anywhere, but I think late in the session we saw a Medical Cannabis Act introduced on the floor as a personal bill. <laughs> no, no, not on the floor. It was not on the clerk's floor. Office. It was in the clerk's yeah. office. What happened and, and how did that happen? Yeah. You have to ask John about that one. What we did this year, I haven't been around yet too. What we did this year is it used to be in, in the, on the House side. This is the Senate side, but on the House side, you could introduce personal bills up to a certain date. We changed that this year. Yeah, this, that, and we said, if you want to introduce a bill, not go through the committee, and for informational reasons only, we can do that through the clerk's office. And that's where that bill came from. The representative entered it through the clerk's office, doesn't go to a committee, never gets a hearing, but it gets the idea out so people can see it. So on that issue, you would have to ask John what he's thinking, where he's going with that. Is that how we're going to see personal bills handled in future legislative sessions? Is that what that was all the about? The House, that was the start of the session when you saw us change that rule, and that was all about. If you remember last year when we had everybody trying to pull bills out of committee and all that, that, stops, that, that ability goes away because they're, they're basically a bill with a number for informational only, and they go to the chief clerks to reside. They can still take that idea. If they can get a chairman to introduce it, go back through the committee. Had no more of introducing the bills to get around the committee. It's just information. Okay. It, it also makes it available on the internet, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, that's, well, that's the system. And to clarify how that worked, before the personal bills went to Ways and Means, right. now they reside with the clerk's office, so you can't pull them away from the clerk because it's not in the committee. Yeah, it's not in the committee. It's in the clerk's office. Yeah. Uh, question for Representative Blaise. So, sure. Uh, on, I think it was 374, the abortion exceptions. Okay. Uh, they're buying. Uh -huh. um, I know this has been an issue in the state party for some time, um, particularly putting health and mayor as an exception. Can you talk about your process for coming up with that bill and a bit about the negotiations that happened over the last two months with pro life groups and the doctors and how we ended up where we ended up. How we ended up where we ended up. Well, it's, to be quite honest, how we ended up where we ended up was that was what everybody could agree on. That was the bare minimum. And so it, it, I know people had concerns about health. People had um, concerns about what might happen in a court case. People had concerns about EMTALA. But in the end, when we were prioritizing lists, particularly for doctors, this was one, was to get rid of the affirmative defense. And so we had been talking with various doctors, the IMA, we've been talking to various pro-life groups um, and our own attorneys, our own house attorneys that are involved in the lawsuit. And so what it finally drilled down to was that that was the bill that was going to provide some relief to the situation, reasonable relief, right? Um, it would codify what the Supreme Court had to say about definitions of what is a pregnancy and what's not a pregnancy. And so that was found to be helpful. So what we got was, I think, what everybody could agree on and not everyone liked, which is often the case with legislation, right? If no one's happy, then it's probably the best that we could do. So I, I would think the next year there'll be additional negotiations to figure out what other tweaks could or could not be done with the legislation. There's, of course, also pending lawsuits, and we need to see what happens there. I have one more for the majority leader. Uh, I asked the speaker already, but what was your reaction to the governor vetoing a library in GS Mill? I hope this doesn't take us an extra day. <laughs> what, did you think, what did you think the override quote was going to be? Uh, I, I, no, I, I think that the, the veto overrides are interesting, right? We wouldn't have had it on the initial vote if the initial vote said the same yeah. and so that we gained on the veto overrides. I think there's been a legitimate effort between the House and the Senate this year to um, it reinforced the fact that we are an independent branch of government. And so we need to make sure that we're acting as that independent branch of government. And as much as we can like the governor, you know, when, when we're outside of session, our job is to do the work for our constituents. And I think that that's, that's what it boiled down to. Um, I know there's some people who are ecstatic that, that the veto override um, failed. I know that there are some people who are incredibly frustrated. It comes down to you know what your personal belief is on, on how you're going to take that vote. But I, I think that that's what's important. And I think we saw that specifically with the property tax bill um, was that the legislature you know, kind of asserted its independence and said, wait, this is what we think is right for Idaho. This is what our constituents want. So this is what we're going to do. With the um, library, material, library materials override vote so close, 
you wish you would have debated? It was just one vote different. I, I think once you get to that point, I don't know that people's minds are changed on the floor. Um, obviously, we caucus. We had some discussions about there. We do not vote in caucus. We never have. We never will unless something changes, and I don't anticipate that changing anytime soon. But um, I, I, it was a good open exchange of information during caucus, and I think that that drove the decision to just take the vote and let's move on. Well, on, on this bill in particular, we had your vote. Yeah, and on this vote in particular, we, we debated this bill twice, mm -hmm. right? So we, we debated it, it came back, amended, and so now people re-debate again. We, we've all been down that road. So the only thing that I think was really changing for people was the veto, and now it's a different it's a different position coming back when it comes back vetoed from the governor. So that's that's the consideration for me. I did change my vote, and, and I look at that as protecting the caucus and protecting the House and the legislature and the, and the separation of powers between branches of government. You kind of saw this this whole year. You see the legislature reassert itself. Votes like that are tough when you have, what, three-fourths of the caucus want to override and miss it by one. But overall this session, you saw the legislature try to take back some of the power that I think that we have lost through the years to the executive branch. And I think you'll see more of that in the years coming. What are some of the examples? You said he, we've seen that already this year. What are some of the examples that we may be point to as a legislature taking back? The, a great example is the override of the property tax bill. Mm -hmm. The great example is the fact that we did have an override bill vote on 314 that failed by one. We're starting to, you know, you start to see the the legislature say, let's take a step back and we have a say at the, the seat at the table now. And I think you'll see more of that. Uh, changing gears with sort of related with legislative power, um, what about JFAC voting? Are you happy with how it is now? Are we going to change? No, there'll be some more changes. I think JFAC voting, I think you saw what happened this year. The committee was pretty united and, and we ended up with a good, reasonable compromise there. I think there's more to do on that committee. Uh, and we'll see what the chief, the co-chairs decide. I know they're discussing some possible changes. And um, one little more when we, get, when we get for next year. But I think you'll start seeing more more um, working together with the Senate. And I think you're going to see more uh, conservative by just going forward. I think people are starting to say we got to be careful what we're doing here. But that's good. They're talking. It's good. The fact that they know that we want a majority of each house, that's good. They're starting to work together because of that. It forces them to come to solutions that we don't have to have that fight on the floor. We have that fight in committee. Thanks. Speaking of working well with the Senate, where did we end up on administrative rules approval? The governor uh, let the bill become um, law without his signature. Um, the Senate did put a couple of amendments that we'll try to fix a little bit like here, but no, that's taken us years, and that's that's a huge step. I'm glad you brought that up, Logan. That was one of the things I talked about, if you remember, starting year two, and we did get that done this year, at least got the ball moving, and that's a good thing. And were, was the body of rules approved, uh, except for the ones that were specifically rejected? Because we've had previous sessions where the entire gamut of rules was... This year was a, a, a mix. I think there was about seven different agency rules that were not approved through a concurrent resolution. The rest were, so the majority of them were. There were some that were not that got left at the end because we never did that omnibus all sweeping, you know, concurrent resolution. If you saw what we did, we tried to coordinate with the House and the Senate committees that had the different agencies that they did that together. If you saw a bunch of those Senate concur resolutions, now it's concur resolutions as those committees brought them forth. So most of them were done. I think there were seven that were. Is that most likely the way things will be done moving forward, committee, germane committees, instead of big omnibus? I would prefer to see that because you have more insight. The omnibus, nobody knows what's in it. I am in the committees do that work, which they shouldn't do. Remember, rules have the effect of law. So I'm hoping we'll have that same thing you saw this year where each of the committees works with their Senate co partners to get to get the rules passed and not passed. And I think also, Dave, please don't blame me out and all, Mr. Speaker, that um, we've also made a more concerted effort to look at some of their report performance reviews to make sure that we're actually looking at what the agency is doing and whether they're meeting their own metrics. And so that in coordination with the rules review, I think is, is important that there's that kind of oversight. And that's the first time you saw that. This year, this, our leadership team together got together and we said, we need to do this. A lot of the problems you have, especially in a year like this where you have so many new folks coming in, they don't have our understanding of what the agency do, then what rules are, they don't. I mean, they're, they're coming at a disadvantage by having those performance reviews available, and we'll do that again next year. It starts them out on the right foot to see what the agency should be doing and is not doing, or what their goals are and what they're meeting and not meeting. And I think also, you know, there's some other things. Speaking of the Senate, how do you think now, in your first year of speakership, uh, how has your relationship been with the pro tem and 
you know, the buying press over time. It's been good. We work well, we work well together. Our leadership teams meet weekly, sometimes more often. We work well together. We don't always agree, but no, it's been cordial. It's, it's been good. It, yeah. It's gone really well. Yeah, but uh, I just know there's been friction in the past, uh, like three or four years ago, where uh, the Senate didn't want to act on must pass bills that the House considered. Um, did you have any of those issues this year? You always have those tradesies at the end, but not like you have in the past. And and we were more open about things. It, it I've been in leadership for a little bit, and this was probably the best year ever. We did work well together, and, and I hope we continue to have that relationship. Again, we don't always agree. Sometimes it get a little heated, but that's part of the process. But if it was good to have an open door. It's like today. We were able to walk over and say this is where we're at. They were able to say where they were at, and we got out of here fast. We, we resolved it. So it's been good working. It's been a good working relationship. What do you think changed uh, to allow for those kinds of relationships? I don't know. Maybe it's excellent majority there. Yeah. <laughs> I I think it's I think it was we started off on the right foot. We were more open than we've been in the past. The gamemanship stuff wasn't there like in the past. And quite frankly, we had a whole new leadership team on our side, and 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 we know those folks have worked with them. And I think it just it just is work and meld and work well. Again, we didn't always agree, but we, we didn't well this year, and I hope we continue to have that good relationship. It's nice to be able to pick up the phone and know that Pro Tim Winder will answer the phone, and while we may disagree, we can talk. There was times during the session we actually met together on the weekend trying to find solutions, so it was good. Uh, I noticed that I don't think anyone listed the genital mutilation bill among the accomplishments this session. Uh, does the leadership believe that was an accomplishment? Yeah. There's some issues. I'm better off to still let them go because they're, uncom they're uncomfortable. And it was one of those tough issues. And some of these issues are tough. It's like we talked about abortion and some of those things. They're tough and they're, they're not one to get. Go waving a flag. It's just one of those things you just do what's right. It is, it is going to be consequential, though. So could you say something on it? Well, it's a good bill. We'll see how it plays out. And there's a lot will happen between now and then. And I don't want to say anything that gets us in trouble with the courts. Because I think that, like you said earlier, some of this stuff's going to be in courts. So we'll see what happens there. Okay. About that. This was the first session in a long time with a new attorney general. Um, and I heard some concerns and maybe even misconceptions from members of your caucus about whether the AG was giving opinions, who he was giving those opinions to. There was even a bill floated to put some timelines on providing those opinions. Uh, how is your relationship as a leadership team like with the Attorney General, and did we see any resolution in that department? I think we're still trying to feel our way through that, so I, I don't know that we're ready to set off a bomb to fight the AG. I, I, I think it, it, he's substantially different in personality than the former Attorney General, so I think we're just trying to figure things out at this point. And we, we had a good relationship. We could sit down and talk. He was more than willing when we had concerns about opinions to talk about, discuss that. He's more than willing to meet with us. And, and we're all new with this, so we're trying to feel our way forward. No, we worked, we worked well with them, and just some concerns about the opinions, and we'll figure out a way forward, but figure out how to work it out. I was going to say, do, do you think that JFAX moved to take a couple DAGs from the AG's office and put it in Pella? So it was going to help alleviate that tension? Well, to be fair, I mean, that was one of um, Attorney General Labrador's suggestions. It wasn't, it wasn't a dig at him whatsoever. It was a suggestion to try to move that. So... I think to try to find conflict in that per particular situation probably isn't true. And so I think that some of that is going to be helpful. And I mean, it, again, we go back to the separation of powers where the, the legislature is trying to, I mean, we are a separate branch of government and there needs to be the line that's made. And I think that's, you know, the start of where that line goes. And he's new too. He's going through the same process we are going through as we learn to be the speaker and the new majority leader. All of us are new. As he's going through that same learning curve. And the one thing I've appreciated is we've had an open door. I can call. He answers the phone. Uh, it, it, the relationship's been good. There's just a couple little issues we're not sure how we're going to proceed with, and we'll work through those. They're not, they're not difficult to accomplish. We'll get through those. I want to quickly talk about the libraries. We talked about the veto override, and not as much about the bill. What do you see as the path forward on that issue? Where did it get hung up in the resolution? Which one, the library bill? I think the biggest concern on the library bill was probably the $2,500 thing. I think everything else would have flown without that. I think that um, it will be resolved next year, but um, I can I point out just for the record, um, some people have put out that I had a conflict because my daughter was working with the libraries and I want to point out that I 
voted for that bill every time, which was not what she was doing. So there's there's some interesting things out there floating around, and that's it's just simply not accurate. Kevin, there's some of these issues, and that's one, ESA is one that sometimes it takes a couple of years to find a solution everybody can get to, and I am I'm pretty confident that you'll see resolution to both those next year. They're not going away. Can I, also, you know, they were they were trying to find a solution. I, I the, the authors of the bill and the groups involved were trying to find a solution. They couldn't get there, and they're planning on working on the interim to try to find a solution to the concerns. Whatever happened with that committee that we were supposed to have for task force last year? On which issue? There was library. supposed to be a library task force that was to be appointed by the speaker and never got it. I don't know. So, sorry, I'm, I'm lost on that one. Right? Yeah, it's just. That was never appointed. That was another guy. <laughs> the second gentleman, well, the second that we're on the second. <laughs> that guy. Brought the turban on. I'm not saying that. I don't think you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else, guys? Hey, Thank by the way, you. we appreciate what you do. I would hate to stand around and wait for us. We apologize for that. <laughs>